Good morning. This is Dr. Ara Duke Majan, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute. For those of you tuned in to this live broadcast of spine surgery being performed here at Duke Spine Institute in Florida, Duke Spine Institute is a advanced uh, specialty spine care center located in Florida. Specifically, we're located in the Space Coast of Florida. For those of you who remember the NASA space program with the space shuttle, and prior to that, um, the rocket programs, including the Atlas rockets, even the Titan rockets, the Apollo program, all of those rockets were launched just 10 minutes drive from where we're located. Our facility is a state-of-the-art facility for spine care, and we perform the most complex spine surgeries in the world right here in our facility. Every surgery you watch here is done outpatient. You are not watching surgery done at a hospital. You're watching surgery done in a surgery center. The surgery center is a special surgery center equipped with the latest, most advanced spine surgery equipment, minus any equipment that's completely unnecessary, like robotics or other types of equipment like uh, O-arms that emit a massive amount of radiation, which is unnecessary during spine surgery. We like to kiss or keep it simple, stupid. At Duke Spine Institute, we use just the equipment that's necessary to get the job done right. What's amazing about our surgeries is several things. Number one, they're done outpatient, meaning these patients go home on an average of one to two hours after their surgery. So there's really no recovery. There's no hospital stay. There's no complications. We've been doing these surgeries now in the surgery center for five years, going on six years, with zero complications at the surgery center with any of our spine surgeries. This is also the site where you'll find the Duke Laser Disc Repair. It's a advanced endoscopic spine surgery that's used to repair herniated discs rather than fuse them or put metal in patients. But today we are going to be putting some metal because some people think Dr. Duke Majan doesn't do spinal fusions, well I do. And I've done personally over a thousand lumbar fusions. So those are fusions done in the lumbar spine or lower back, and that's what we'll be performing today on this patient. I've also done approximately 400 posterior cervical laminectomy infusions. Uh, over a hundred of them I've done at the surgery center here where you're watching, outpatient. All of our patients, as I said, go home usually an hour after surgery. They can't drive home, they need a driver, but they're up on their feet walking around and with controlled pain immediately after surgery. And that has everything in the world to do with the technique that I use. So what is that technique that I use? Well, we're showing it to you with this live stream. The surgery you're watching, if you're watching today on December 3rd, 2019, is a live stream. Live streams are unique because what it does is it brings you, the viewer, right into the operating room with the team, with me, and you get to see me operate. The view you're watching right now we call the eye in the sky or third person view. You're looking over the shoulder of the surgeon. In a few minutes I'm going to go into the operating room and start the real part of the surgery after the exposure. And that real part of the surgery involves removing bone and then doing the fusions, inner body cages, osteotomies <coughs> and instrumentation. When I get in there and start doing the major part of the surgery, you're going to get to see a surgeon's view. So it's going to be very different than a third person. You're going to get the view from basically my eyes, my head, and you're going to get it in real time. So why do we do real time? We do real time for several reasons. Number one, the viewer gets to see what's going on in surgery as it unfolds. You get exposure to the actual operation and any complications or I issues that come up uh, during the surgery, you get to see them in real time. In other words, um, as decisions are being made in surgery, you get to watch those decisions, how we handle them. If there's an issue or something that comes up, you get to be part of that. You get to participate in the surgery as though you're in the operating room standing in the surgeon's shoes. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we're providing you an unedit unedited uh, surgical stream, which basically means we're not cutting anything out. We're, this is not uh, Hollywood. We're not cutting and pasting things uh, and removing the scenes that uh, we don't want you to see. 
we're showing you the full kit and caboodle, the whole surgery from beginning to end. And what that does is it creates uh, what's called transparency or reality. And we're not altering the reality in any way. We're giving you the full story, the full stream. So why would we ever want to do this? We want to do this because I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding and myth about spine surgery. And my goal and part of the goal of the Duke Spine Foundation is to educate the public about the truth about spine surgery. The public being other surgeons, other healthcare providers, uh, lay people such as many of the people that watch these live streams. And we usually have about a thousand viewers who watch these streams. Um, you get to see basically truth, the truth in spine surgery. Nothing is sugar-coated, nothing is removed or added to the, uh, to the equation. You get really the, the real deal. And so it's important that people get to see the real deal because then they know what, what they're dealing with, right? If you go out to buy a car, you want to see that car. You want to touch it. You want to feel it. You want to smell it. You want to turn the engine over. You want to listen to it. You want to basically um, make sure that you understand as much as you can about what you're getting. Well, it's no different with spine surgery. Consumers should know what they're getting. They shouldn't just believe a, a surgeon in a white coat talking to them in a room. They should see it with their own eyes. They should see the experience. They should be able to test drive it. And so that's what we're providing for people, we're giving them the opportunity to see what spine surgery really is about. And you know, many of our patients that we do surgeries on are happy to give us an interview in the recovery room as they're leaving. I believe this patient will be the same way. So we're going to stream the surgery, and then we're going to give him about an hour or two to recover, and then we're going to stream him leaving. So you'll be able to see him getting up, walking around, and leaving the facility about two hours after his surgery. That's what I expect. So this live streaming, real um, TV showing spine surgery, I think, is necessary so that people will be able to understand the truth about spine surgery. As I said, there's a lot of misconceptions. Now, I'm going to tell you something else is very important. What you see done here is really done virtually nowhere else in the world. In other words, when you watch the space shuttle launch here at NASA, um, it's not like there's space shuttles being launched in every city. A lot of people don't know that. You know, when I was a kid and I saw the shuttle launch, I thought, oh, I looked outside my window and I grew up in Thousand Oaks, California, and I said, where's the shuttle? I don't see it. In other words, we all have a sense that what happens on television happens everywhere. It doesn't happen everywhere. The kind of surgery you're watching done today can only happen in one place. That's Duke Spine Institute. So not every surgeon is capable of doing what we do. Not every hospital is capable of doing what we do. As a matter of fact, less than 1% of them can do what I do during the surgery. So that's another reason why we do the broadcast is so that people can understand this is the best. This is what's available. Just like when you watch the shuttle launch or a rocket launch, you're seeing the best technology we have in aerospace technology. It doesn't mean that it's available everywhere. It's available in one place. That's NASA, Kennedy Space Center. Okay? And um, it's just like this surgery is available in one place. That's Duke Spine Institute. So if you want the very best in spine care, you're going to have to travel to Duke Spine Institute because we don't have a mobile operating room. Now, that being said, uh, during the surgery, we do allow questions to be asked, and I answer them in real time. And many times, I can actually show you really good resolution of what's happening. For example, this camera we call the eye in the sky, we can actually zoom in and see more detail, okay, because it's a high-definition system. It allows us to do that. Right now, what we're looking at, for example, is an incision in the skin. This is a patient's back, and we're coming just above the butt crack. Um, you can see the patient has a tattoo on their skin. That's what that coloration is at the bottom of your screen on the skin. And Lori is placing the retractors right now into the incision, and what's being retracted is the patient's muscles. We're not cutting the muscles or damaging them. We're just moving them over. So to move them over, you have to peel them off the bone, and then you have to use a retractor to move them over. And what you see down there, um, if she moves her hand, we'll be able to see it, is the actual spine itself. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, that, that's the spinous processes she just pointed to. So in a few minutes, I'm going to get into that operating room, and I'm going to put on my camera, and you're going to be able to see the surgeon's view. 
okay? And we'll take questions throughout the surgery. I have Sean here sitting next to me. We're in the uh, control center for broadcasting at Duke Spine Institute right now. And we're going to be taking questions to ask a question that you'd like me to answer. All you have to do is bring up the dialog box and type it in. And when you type it in, everyone will be able to see the question and we'll repeat it. And I'll answer it through my microphone while I'm operating. Just two more points. Um, number one, we do have an app that Duke Spine Institute has released. It's called Duke Spine Institute. So if you go to your app store, whether you're on Android or Apple, iOS, you can find the app. It's free. We don't charge for it to be downloaded or used. And in the app, you can um, do all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of information about spine conditions with pictures. It's a very helpful resource with a library. There's also the ability to communicate with our staff. You could schedule a um, MRI review where you could submit your MRI and Dr. Duke Mage and myself, I'll review it personally and see what can be done to help you if you have a neck or a back issue. And you can also get uh, schedule a video conference for free. These are all free services we do at Duke Spine Institute. So they're available to the public, to anyone that wants to take advantage of it. And there's a lot of other resources in the app. I strongly recommend you check out the Duke Spine Institute app and download it onto your phone. It's free, and I think it's a great resource. You're going to find a lot of interesting stuff in there. All right, the other thing I would like to say is Duke Spine Institute has a Facebook um, group. It's free and open to the public. It's called Spine Surgery Support Group. You don't have to have surgery in order to join. Anyone can join that has an interest in learning uh, about spine care. And in that spine surgery support group on Facebook, you can ask questions and they're answered by our staff. So we uh, pretty much allow anybody to get into the group and um, obviously keep the uh, conversation appropriate and relevant and germane and uh, the questions will be posted and answers will be posted. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna head down to the operating room now and join Lori and get started on um, the actual, what we actually came here for, all right?
pictures and videos. You gotta ask me before you do that. Why do you want to take my picture? What is this back here? What is you can't put tape on the knobs. Who put tape on the knobs? No, it's never never, never put there. I don't know why. Yeah, but you you can put it something. You need a system to control the wires. But you can't block the knob. Does that make sense? You can put it there, but it's not the right place to put it. In other words, you can use tape to control the wires, but don't put it on the knob. Does that make sense? The knobs have to be free for me to use. pretty good. I'm happy with that. So the mic goes around this way. Yeah. All right, let me know if you can hear me. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, you want to give me a countdown? We're already live, so you're good to go. Okay. All right, Dr. Duke Majin here. I'm in the operating room with our patient, and we're live streaming. So if you're watching this live stream on December 3rd, 2019, you're likely watching a live stream. If you're watching it on another day, you may be watching a recorded live stream. How's our blood pressure, sir? That's good. You can bring it up slightly if you want to. Do you have my cable off my right side? Do you have the cable? Yes. You already got the, oh good, you're fast. <laughs> Okie dokie. So, um, that's our shot? No, that's not our shot. We were just waiting to make sure you were doing yeah, that. So it should be a full shot. Well, um, all right, let's see where we are. Yeah. Shot? So that's the pedicle of five. And then the pedicle of four should be up here. Shot. Okay. Uh, right there, 
should be. You're pulsing, right? Yeah. Shot. All right. That looks like the Federal 04. You agree? Yeah. Okay. Why do I feel like these cables? Let's get the table down, floor out. Sir, can you check the arms when we bring the floor north? Make sure that the floor is not on the elbows. The cable feels like it's pulling at the back of my neck. Are the cables supported? Are you guys ready? What's that? Yeah, good. Yeah, you always want to make sure when he moves the floor north that it's not pushing on the elbows or forearm. And um, did they go over the positioning of the arms with you? You know about positioning and surrender, right? Padded elbows this way, not ever more than 90 degrees. Otherwise, they get ulnar neuropathies. Okay, great. So Dr. Duke Majin here, and uh, Lori's done a great job of what we call the exposure. So the first part of surgery is always positioning, prep and drape. That's just laying the patient on the table properly, and then uh, prepping and draping the skin and the surgical site, the operative site. And then there's uh, the exposure, which is where we come in and basically um, expose the part of the body that we're going to be operating on. So if it's your gallbladder surgery you're having, then the surgeon will be exposing your gallbladder. That means a cut through the abdominal wall and expose the gallbladder, right? So you can operate on it. So with spine surgery, what we're exposing is the spine because that's what we're operating on is the spine. But there's a lot of tissues above the spine that we have to get past in order to get down to the spine, okay? And those tissues are the skin, the fascia and the muscle. Once we've gotten past, I need a smaller top. Once you've gotten past the skin, the fascia, and the muscle, then we got the spine exposed the way we want it to be. Bovi. So um, we need to get a little bit more lateral on our exposure. So his uh, screw entry points are going to be further lateral. Watch your head with my light. Now, because we're, we're going to be, you always want to detach this muscle off the sacrum because it's going to make retracting a lot easier. And you actually don't need to open the skin more. Okay. You just kind of pull it back and detach. Okay. So that's more relaxed there. How are we doing on per chemical paralysis? It looks like good. Yeah. So we believe this is the sacrum, this is the L5 lamina, this is the L4 lamina. You agree? Yeah, that's ligamentum flavum. Yeah. So his facets are actually pretty wide, wider than I thought they would be. But men's facet joints are typically wider than women's. That's just an anatomical difference. All right. So I'm using a hot knife, which is otherwise known as a bovie. And I'm basically detaching the soft tissues off of the spine so we can get the surgery done. And really, when you're doing surgery, the exposure, which is exposing the surgical site, is really, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of the entire surgery. If you don't do the exposure right, then it makes the rest of the surgery really difficult to do. 
And, you know, honestly, it makes it even un unsafe for the patient if the exposure isn't done properly. So I spent a lot of time preparing just to get the exposure just right and make the rest of the surgery go very smooth. All right, let's see what we got over here. Huh? Seems like it was higher in the front line. Yeah. I like how you preserve the capsule here. You did the right thing. You always want to preserve the capsule where you're not going to be sacrificing the joint. Uh, you did a nice job there. Is our pressure going up a little bit? Yeah. You're getting a little more bleeding, which is fine. It's not a problem yet. All right. I'm going to reposition these retractors. What the heck? What is that doing there? Come on, guys. Keep this field clear. So part of live stream means you get to hear everything I say. And... Uh, I am not a gentleman in the operating room, for those of you who don't know me. I'm going to tell my staff when they screw up, and you're going to hear it. They get to tell me when I screw up, too. Don't worry. Which doesn't really happen very often, to be <laughs> honest with you. All right, good. <coughs> so the other thing you get to see is what, what do we talk about in the operating room while we're operating? Do we talk about anything? A lot of people think during surgery it's very quiet. But we actually play music. We have conversations. Once things are going well, we'll start telling jokes. This yellow stuff is fat. All right, so we know this is the pedicle of four, pedicle of five, pedicle of S1. Yeah, I think we're about ready. I may have to get a little more lateral exposure later, but I'm ready to get started. So we know from the MRI this patient has narrowing of the neural foramen and lateral recess where the nerves are being pinched. And part of the surgery that I have to do is I have to make sure that the alignment of this patient's spine is good alignment when I'm done. Because after all, we're fusing it, right? So when we fuse the spine, we don't want the alignment to be bad. We want it to be fused in good alignment. A lot of people with disc problems have bad alignment issues. Because as the disc collapses, the alignment gets worse. <coughs> so one of my jobs is to, is to correct the alignment or preserve it if it's good to begin with. Another job I have is to unpinch nerves. So pinch nerves cause leg symptoms like weakness, numbness, tingling. So a good spine surgeon includes a decompression, which means to take the pressure off of the nerves that need to be decompressed. You can already see the ligament is hypertrophied here. So a hypertrophied ligament usually means the body is trying to, is trying to stabilize that segment because it's unstable. Ligaments don't hypertrophy and thicken if um, there's no instability. So the fact that there's hypertrophy ligament tells me it's a sign that there's a problem with stability here. And this is the L45 se segment that has a really thick ligament. All right, Woody. So, so far I've done a removal of the spinous process and I've started the laminectomies. Yeah. And this is that thickened ligamentum flavum right here. 
It's not only thickened, but it's scarred. So it's an indication of inflammation. Where could that inflammation be coming from? Well, arthritis is an inflammatory disease, so it's coming from the arthritis. But to have arthritis in the spine, you have to have arthritic joints. So what are the joints in the spine that could get arthritis? The most likely candidate is always going to be the facet joints. That's this joint here and here. And I can already see they're abnormal. They're enlarged and they're arthritic. They're definitely not normal. Arthritic joints tend to stick together from scar tissue and bone spurs. Yeah, I can feel the dura. The dura is really stuck down. It should not be stuck down, but it's stuck down from all the arthritis from these facet joints right here. So I'm using a wood sun to gently tease the dura. Look at all the scar tissue right here. See all that? You guys see all that right there? That's not normal. That's all scar tissue. Look at it, it's like a web down here. Can you see that, Sean? Yes, we can. Yeah, those are like scarred veins <coughs> from all the inflammation. So clearly this is an injured segment of the spine that we're dealing with, and that's causing this patient's pain along with their disc problem, the inflammation in their herniated disc. But all this is thickened ligament and scarred down. You can see all the white color tissue, that's scar tissue. So we definitely have an inflammatory process here. This is the dura. The dura is supposed to be perfectly white, clear. The dura is a membrane covering the nerve roots. Now this facet joint is so hypertrophied and scarred down that the only way I'm going to get the alignment to be perfect here is going to be to remove this abnormal facet joint. I also feel stenosis here in the lateral recess. It's bilateral. It's on both sides. Seems to be worse on the right. A lot more stenosis here. So I'm going to do a decompressive laminectomy, and I'm going to have to unpinch the nerves on both sides because there's narrowing and pinching of the nerves. You're going to see the nerves. They run just underneath this. So this patient needs a bilateral laminectomy at L4. So please document. Um, on your nurse's note, bilateral stenosis L4-5 required bilateral laminectomy. <laughs> Amy, will you help her with that? So now for me to be able to get the alignment right, I got to get rid of this abnormal facets because the spine is not moving here. It's fixed. Fixed is rigid is, is okay if it's in good alignment. But this patient has an alignment issue too. We call it a flat back. So they have some flat back deformity, which means they've lost the curvature right here at the segment. And that's due to the collapsed disc and the facet disease. So I want to put the curve back. To do that, I got to get rid of this facet joint. So we do what's called a Smith Peterson osteotomy to correct deformity. Most surgeons don't know how to do this and they don't feel comfortable doing it. Obviously, we're using a high-powered drill, 1,000 revolutions per minute right next to the nerve. So most neurosurgeons don't even feel comfortable doing this procedure. They don't do it. The problem is if you don't do it, you're not going to get the alignment corrected. You don't correct the alignment, then the patient is hunched forward the rest of their life because you just fused them in a hunched forward position. And that means they're going to have back pain the rest of their life because of alignment problems. I don't want that for my patient. See, I'm a believer that you should always do things right the first time. Fix the spine properly during surgery. And that's because I do that, I need a cob. Because I do that, my patients do better than anyone else that has does spinal fusions. Our average pain relief is 95%. Mallet? Mallet? So patients that have back pain from before surgery, 95% of that back pain goes away on average with my fusions. Same thing with the leg symptoms. 95% goes away with the surgery on average. 
Why is that? Why do I have 95% relief? Is that typical? No, it's not typical. There's no other, there are very few spine surgeons in the world that can get 95% average relief of back pain and leg symptoms with spine surgery. Most spine surgeons tell their patients 50-50 at best. And that's true, large bite. This is that thickened ligament I was talking about. See where it was? It was underneath this bone and it was literally pushing on the nerve root right here. Right there, that's part of the stenosis. So I just removed the facet, the inferior facet of L4. Now I gotta remove this thickened ligament. I gotta do it without injuring the dura or the nerve roots. Very thick. That's part of the uh, stenosis right there is the thickened ligament, K5. So the L5 nerve root is literally right, right under here. I can feel it's getting pinched still by what's left. So I gotta remove more of this. This is part of that bilateral decompression. But you see, this is not part of a laminectomy. This goes beyond a normal laminectomy. So to be able to decompress the nerve root, sometimes you have to do a lot more than what's normally done. And this is the main reason why most spine surgeries fail, is the spine surgeons don't do this stuff. They don't go above and beyond what, you know, what's normally what they would expect. But to fix the problem, you have to. I can feel this patient's pedicles are short. Uh, let me have a smaller kerosene. Four. So this is where the L5 nerve root is. Eight, Suck, please. Do you have that documented Suck, please. Pedicles? Yeah, short pedicles, document that. Okay. Yeah, I can barely get my uh, kerosene in there. There's a kerosene four. It should be able to, on a normal spine, this would be wide open right here. This is called the lateral recess. All right, and it's, this is narrow for two reasons. Number one, sh short pedicle, sorry, three reasons. Number one, short, yeah, hold that over. Number one, short pedicle, which he was born with. Number two, hypertrophied facet. This facet joint is enlarged, and it's enlarged medially and anteriorly here, compressing the nerve root in the lateral recess. And number three, the uh, disc herniation right here. There's a disc herniation crushing the nerve from the front. So the nerve is getting crushed from the front by the herniated disc from the back by the ligament and facet joint getting enlarged. And all this is a setup by the short pedicles. All right, kerosene five. Huh? That's a vein, yeah. We're just gonna leave it alone for now. Yeah, right there, it's so tight. So we still have to open that up. Now that's the L5 lamina. We're going to have to do an L5 laminectomy as well. So we're going to do an L4 and L5 laminectomy for stenosis, bilateral. Now I'm going to go out the foramen here and open this up because that's where the L4 nerve root is, right here. So folks, what you're watching right now is called the decompression. And it's so important. And most surgeons don't do this during their fusion. I would say... Probably 95% of spine surgeons don't do this, which is why patients still have problems after their surgery. Because they don't need just a fusion, they need a decompression and a fusion. All right, this is the L4 pedicle on the left side right here, and that's going out the foramen, and you can see that the uh, ligament in the foramen is, is really scarred up pretty bad. All right, let me get in there. All right, it's very tight. The foramen is so tight. Uh, I gotta get all this out. So let me have a bovie and a cob. This patient has foramenal stenosis. Stenosis, come on, I need the right cob, guys. I don't use a big cob. Been doing the same thing. All right. Um, foramenal stenosis is probably the most common. Foramenal lateral recess stenosis, the most common reason these surgeries don't work on patients. The surgeon just didn't do, do it right. <sighs> All right, so, come on, did you wipe it? You see how hypertrophied this is, Lori? It goes way out lateral. Take it. I need the woods in, I'm gonna drill. Lower the volume a little bit. All right, so here's the problem. This is just halfway out the foramen and the nerve is still getting crushed.
So the only way to open this up is to put a kerosene in here, which will crush the nerve even more, or to actually do an osteotomy. This is all part of something called the Smith-Peterson osteotomy, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. It's a beautiful procedure. I did not develop it. It was developed by Smith and Peterson. But it works wonders for uh, decompressing laterally. I've actually published this technique on my paper that I published, I think it was maybe 2013 or 14, on um, the combined anterior inner body, posterior lateral with osteotomy. And our results, like I said, for relief of pain and the back and leg are second to none. They're really the best in the world. All right, Kerrison. So you can see I did that little osteotomy there of the tip of the superior articular process of L5. And now I'm able to safely remove the compression of the nerve root in the foramen right there. You all see that? I know, Lori, I know you saw it. <laughs> Bipolar. All right, so I'm in the foramen. I'm encountering a little bit of bleeding, right? Come on, Luis, get this guy trained. And some surgeons would make the mistake of using a bovi in the foramen. The problem with the bovi is the charge leaves and it goes to the bovi pad on the thigh and it can actually bovey so much it'll burn the nerve root right there. So what I use is I use the bipolar to avoid dispersion of charge and injuring the nerve root. And this right here is a blood vessel lateral to the facet. This is what's been feeding that arthritic facet. That's why it's such a bloody mess because when you get arthritis of a joint, the arthritis process causes an ingrowth of new blood vessels and those blood vessels are really leaky. And uh, arthritis or in chronic inflammation requires a good blood supply. It's like fighting a battle, you know, your soldiers on the front line need food, they need weapons, they need ammunition, so you gotta keep supplying, supply, supply, supply. Well, arthritis is a very um, metabolically active process and it requires a huge supply of oxygen and sugar, glucose, and cells, you know, to fight. So, unfortunately, you get a hypertrophy of blood vessels right around the hypertrophied facet. Anyway, we're right on top of the nerve root. That's the uh, left L4 nerve root right there, literally right there going out the foramen. And right now I can tell you it's totally decompressed, totally decompressed. And right here there's a little shelf I'm going to take out with a kerosene 5. Lori, you're going to miss this in a couple of months? Yeah, right? You don't have to. Suck, suck. Oh, look at that shelf right there. That's right over the disc. If you don't do this part right here, then you're not going to be able to get low enough on the pedicle below to really get a good discectomy. And what, result, what happens is the surgeon's going to be stuck putting in a small cage. Okay, please don't distract us. Luis, let's keep it to a minimum. Right here. So to be able to do the, the get right size cage. Here, take that. Come on. Gel foam. What I'm getting at is the disc I have to take out is right here. And I'm going to put a cage in there. If you don't do this bone work that I just did, which most surgeons don't do it, then you can't get a big enough cage into the disc space. If you don't put a big enough cage in the disc space, then you're not going to correct the kyphosis at this segment. And you're going to maintain kyphosis or flat back. We don't want that. We want the spine curving back towards us at this segment. To do that, you got to get a huge cage in there. You're not going to get a huge cage in unless you take all that little bits of bone out. They, they're going to limit the size of the cage that goes in. Okay? So very important. All right. Let's do your side. Anybody know which leg bothers this patient more? Yeah, he said right, but he has yeah. Weak yeah, that's your the right Symptoms side. That's the side that actually has the more stenosis. Yeah. I can feel it. Okay. Symptoms on both. Though. Yeah, both. I know. He has bilateral leg symptoms, but right's worse. Yeah. We're on the right side right now, and that earlier I felt this 
lateral recess. There's so much thickness of this ligament right here. That's really the main cause of the compression is the thickened ligamentum flavum and capsule of the facet that's hypertrophied. And it's just crushing the nerve root. That's why this patient is developing weakness in the legs, numbness in the legs. So the decompression is very important. By the way, <coughs> I'm just kind of talking about this because it's, in it's interesting. But when a patient lies on their belly and curves their back back or they stand up and walk, they actually narrow these holes where the nerves go out. So they make the compression worse by standing and walking. We call that neurogenic claudication. Well, when I fuse them, I need to fuse them in a configuration where they're basically in the standing and walking alignment. So it really is going to narrow the holes down. So if you don't do this decompression, it's very tight here in the foramen. If you don't do this decompression in your surgery as a surgeon, your patient's going to still have leg symptoms afterwards. But my patients, 95% of the leg symptoms go away because I actually do this step. All right, drilling again right through the pars. This is part of the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. It's not part of a laminectomy. Laminectomies don't include this. Laminectomy has already been done a long time ago. Kerosene four or three. So this goes beyond a normal laminectomy, way beyond. All right, osteotome, Cobb basically, and uh, mallet. Again, we have a hypertrophied abnormal facet. We're going to evict. Oh, yeah, baby. Look at all those bone spurs and all that thickened stuff. Large bite. There's an arthritic surface there, just devoid of any collagen or cartilage, I mean. It's huge, by the way. It can't even fit into the large bite. Take. Yeah, so all the, the cartilage is gone. You got bone on bone. You got bone spurs right there. A lot of bone spurs. Thickened capsule. So hallmarks of arthritis. Now, we're not done. We still have to remove more of this hypertrophied ligament and facet. Anyone see this new movie that came out uh, with Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio? Once upon a time in yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Really? I saw it. Did you like it? I fell asleep like three times. <laughs> and it's well, well. Quentin Tarantino. Oh God. So here's what I think. I think there's a lot of Hollywood culture in the movie. I just don't know it because I'm not a Hollywood guy. Right. But I, there's probably all kinds of like little messages that I just have no clue. Because Quentin I know. That's the only reason I say that is he always has pretty smart about his movies, right. his scenes. But so much of it's just lost to the average person, I think. Yeah. All right, Kerrison, four. 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 That's why I gave you back the five. I want a smaller one. Why would you give me back a five? To most people that don't know the Hollywood culture, it probably just seems like a pretty random movie, a.k.a. me. I was hoping somebody could shed some insight on it. Kerosene 3. Or we can just turn the volume up on the music, or we could answer a question from our audience. Sean, what question do you have? We have a couple. One of our viewers asks, if you send patients home so soon after surgery, how do you manage their pain? All right, if you send patients home so soon after surgery, how do you manage their pain? I love that question. The answer is you don't create the pain. Wow. And that's exactly the truth. We don't create the pain. We don't, we don't have any special gizmos or gadgets or anything. We literally just do good surgery, and that reduces the amount of pain after surgery. Come on, Garrison 5, dude. Wake up. Um, that, that's the God's honest truth is we use the same medications everyone else uses. We just use them properly. But more importantly than that, literally 90% of the pain in after a spine surgery like this comes from the muscles. And that's why I use heavy muscle relaxation. 
right? Our anesthesiologist understands that because I ask for a lot of muscle relaxation and I don't retract the muscles longer than three hours. So if you don't retract the muscles longer than really two and a half hours, three hours, I need you to suck, mm -hmm. then you're not gonna get all that pain after surgery from a fusion. So there's your answer, gel foam. It's a very simplistic way of answering your question, but it's the truth. The pain after spine surgery doesn't come from the skin. It doesn't come from the spine. It actually comes from the muscle. 90% of spine pain after spine surgery comes from the muscles. These muscles right here that we've pushed over. Okay, but we were very gentle in how we handled them, okay? We did it from the very beginning. So I'm gonna tell you a secret. Virtually 100% of spine surgeons out there have no clue that the pain comes from the muscles. They don't know where it comes from. They just know there's pain. They don't really think about it. But I started thinking about it a long time ago and I realized the pain was coming from the muscle. A lot of that has to do with my sister. She's a chiropractor. And she taught me that the pain was muscular. So I started thinking about it. Well, muscles, yeah, I definitely, I move them over. What can I do to reduce muscle pain since I'm the one responsible for causing it, right? The surgeon causes the muscle pain, so what can I do to reduce it? So I started thinking about strategies. One of them is use lots of muscle relaxers during surgery, and that's what we're doing. The other is be very careful when you take the muscle off the bone. Most spine surgeons, give me a cob. When they take the muscle off the bone, give me the big cob. They use this big metal device and they literally get on the muscle and they rip it right off the spine. Okay, that's how I was taught to do it. Some of my doctors that taught me, taught me the Bovi technique that we use currently. It's called a subperiosteal dissection. So I use subperiosteal dissection. I don't retract the muscles for longer than two and a half hours. And um, we put l uh, special medicine into the muscle called um, Exparol, which everybody has access to. It's not just unique to us. Um, I don't get a lot of bleeding because I keep the blood pressure down so I don't get hematomas in the muscle. There's a lot of little strategies I use, but that's 90% of your pain after surgery. So because I take good care of the muscle, Woody, I'm able to prevent muscle pain. So I guess to answer your question, prevention. Prevent the pain rather than treat the pain, right? That's really what I do different. Harrison. Hey. We have a couple more questions. Sure. We one viewer asking, what are your success rates with open surgery? My success rates with this type of open surgery are, are the best in the world. Uh, I mentioned them earlier, 95% relief of back pain from the herniated disc and 95% relief of leg symptoms. 95%. And I've published our results. When I published them, um, the back pain relief was 85% and the leg pain relief was 92%. But since then, we've looked at our data and the results have gotten even better since I published back in 2013, I think. That was, what, six years ago, seven years ago? So a large bite. So what's our complication rate? Complications are less than 1%. So less than one in 100 patients will have a complication when I do the surgery. So literally they're the best fusion results in the world. There's no surgeon that has better results. You can look in uh, PubMed, Harrison Five. You can look in PubMed at all the published results out there and you'll find none better than my results. I'm not trying to brag. What I'm trying to do is tell you that where you go is important. I don't want people thinking, oh, I'll go get a spinal fusion down at the corner surgeon. I'm going to have the same results as Dr. Dugmajan because you're not. That's the whole point. Now, if your local corner spine surgeon did the surgery exactly the way I do it, then you will have the same results as I have. There's no magic to what I do. I just do good surgery. But I do a lot of steps that most spine surgeons don't do. I know that because I know 
what all these spine surgeons do out there. And I see their results. Believe me, spine surgeons are, are very happy to share their results when they're good. So if you think about it, all those results that you see out there, those are their best results. And if the best results are 50-50 improvement in back pain, then those spine surgeons really don't have much to share, do they? I mean, that's pretty much the standard. This is definitely stenotic. So the laminectomy at this level is something that's necessary. And the facet joint is very enlarged. Um, let me see a, let me see a Cobb and Bovey. So 95% success of eliminating the back pain before surgery that the patient has and 95% leg symptoms. That's our results. And a complication rate that's around 1% or slightly less. Woody. Now this is the side that the patient's having the most leg pain and there's definitely stenosis at this level as well. I can feel it right here in the foramen. It feels like bone and ligament down here in the lateral recess. So I have to open this up. I just want to make sure I stay below the pedicle. You don't want to get into the pedicle with this drill because you'll ruin the surgery. And it's very easy to do, by the way. The reason is we're going to have to put screws in the pedicle. So if I ruin the pedicle, by drilling a hole in it, then the screw is not going to hold very well. So it's really important that you stay, you know, away from the pedicles and work between them. Oh yeah, that's nice. Again, that takes tremendous skill and experience and knowledge to do that. Everything you see I'm doing, it looks see easy, right? Looks like you could probably do this at home. But the reality is, is that it took me many years to develop exactly every one of these movements. Everything from the way I'm holding this is just literally perfectly thought out. Because the thing about surgery that many people don't appreciate is that you're working in a very small space. Like there's a bleeder right here, right? I can't really see it because it's underneath this muscle. I can't cut through the muscle to find it because that'll create more bleeding and it'll injure the muscle. So I actually have to know where the bleeder is, and I know it's coming right here. That's why I went there with the tip of my bobe, right there, because that's where that bleeder always is. I know exactly where it is. Most surgeons don't know. They're like, oh, I don't know where it is. I'll just bobe everything. And you end up with a big lump of scar tissue after surgery because they basically screwed everything up trying to, s trying to do the surgery properly. Yep. You know, what I'm an advocate for, truly, is not spine surgery. I'm an advocate for people to know the truth and be educated and aware so they can make good choices for themselves. And I'm an advocate for spine surgeons learning how to do the surgeries the right way so that they don't have the bad outcomes and complications that they typically have by doing it the right way. So I, I don't know what you call that being an advocate for, but that's what I want. I want surgeons to do these surgeries properly to give patients the best outcome possible. And I want patients to be good consumers of healthcare. Another question. Yeah. One of our viewers asks, can you, can you treat back pain caused by stenosis without doing open surgery? All right, so one of our viewers says, can you treat back pain? caused by stenosis without doing open surgery. So first of all, stenosis, spinal stenosis, never, ever, ever causes back pain, ever. Stenosis means narrowing. Narrowing pinches nerves. Pinch nerves cause leg pain, not back pain, okay? What causes the back pain is the facet joint arthritis or arthritis in the facet joint or herniated discs. You know, those are the most common causes, right? So there's other things like fractures and tumors 
<coughs> that cause back pain as well. But stenosis itself never causes back pain. It causes leg symptoms like weakness, numbness, tingling, or neurogenic claudication. But um, stenosis never causes back pain. Now, you may have back pain, but it's not from a stenosis. And yes, I can fix it without open surgery. You bet, 100%. I can fix it most of the time, about 99% of the time, without open surgery, gel foam. All right, our foramen is decompressed. I'm going to put some gel foam in there, soaked in thrombin, to stop the bleeding. That's really what this stuff does. Okay, this is the very best way to do this. So what you're seeing, by the way, folks, is is my technique. Um, every single thing I do is unique to Dr. Duke Majin and the Duke Spine Institute. My technique, the Duke Spine technique. So we call this the Duke Spine Fusion. So what I mean by that is that that area that I just covered with this gel foam, what I did, not every surgeon will do the same thing. Some surgeons won't do that. They'll actually go in there with a bipolar and try to bipolar the bleeder. It's the wrong thing to do, but that's the individuality of the procedure, is every surgeon does it different. If I took a thousand spine surgeons and told them to do the same surgery, they literally, every step would be different. You would never be able to overlay one surgery over another, because every moment that each doctor is doing something different. So how you do a spinal fusion is very important. They are not all the same, and the results are definitely not the same. So why am I broadcasting these surgeries for spine surgeons? So that they'll learn the right way to do the surgery. That's really what it comes down to. How do I know it's the right way? Because my results are better than anyone in the world. So the moment somebody does spine surgery and they have better results than me, I'll do it their way. It's that simple. I'm not here to, uh, to say my way is the best way when it isn't. It really is. I'm not broadcasting brain surgery, even though I'm a brain surgeon, Harrison Five. The reason is that my brain surgery isn't better than other spine surgeons, uh, other neurosurgeons' brain surgery. It's just that simple. <coughs> I do carpal tunnel releases very well, and I do spine surgery very well. My brain surgery Kung Fu with brain surgery is no better than anyone else's, I don't think. And probably not as good as most neurosurgeons that do brain surgery a lot. So what I'm saying to you is that I'm not some egomaniac trying to show you my surgery because I think they're the best, but they really aren't. No, they really are the best. <laughs> and that's why we broadcast this. It's all on my dime. Pretty much the foundation and my money. So... If I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't be spending my money on it, on trying to teach others. Yeah, these are different times. It's definitely narrowing here. So we also have bilateral stenosis at L5-S1, and I can feel the nerves being pinched. So bilateral stenosis, L4-5, bilateral stenosis, L5-S1. Drill. So what I mean by that is that in the traditional way, the only way surgeons learned to do surgery was by either reading books about surgery or going and doing a training program. But now with the uh, internet and the high definition and our ability to broadcast, I can teach surgeons around the world with my technique without writing a book and without becoming a faculty member, even though I am a faculty member, without becoming a faculty member at a medical school. As a matter of fact, the influence that I can have on spine surgeons is far greater with this broadcast than if I were to teach at a university for 20 years. Why is that? Because number one, this broadcast is available to everyone in the world free. So anyone with a computer and an internet connection <coughs> can see this surgery. <coughs> Plus it's recorded so they can watch it any time. Now you tell me that's not better than actually going into an operating room and trying to look over the shoulder of a surgeon all day just to learn a procedure. So. This digital streaming is a better way of teaching, in my opinion, in many ways, than just watching a surgery from an operating room. I need a Woodson and Kerrison 5. Actually, K5, I already got the Woodson. So I believe in it as a teaching tool. That's why we're here broadcasting. Trust me, 
There's a downside to broadcasting. If there's a cost to it, there's people I have to pay. Um, there's risk that there could be a, a mistake made and that I would be held liable for it malpractice-wise. And in malpractice, surgeons can lose, they can lose everything they have, their, everything they have for their family, all their wealth, anything they've accumulated, they can lose all of it. There was a spine surgery malpractice case just last year where the jury awarded $120 million. I don't have $120 million, not even close. Harrison three, but um, I could lose everything by doing this broadcast. But why do I do it? Because I believe in the educational power, the teaching power of watching a live surgery like this. I believe in sharing what I've learned with other people so that they can have better for themselves. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. I'm tired of seeing failed surgeries. I'm tired of seeing people living in pain. I'm not tired, it just bothers me. I don't know, tired is not the right word, but I've never wanted to see people suffering. It's always bothered me since I was a kid. So my goal is to take people out of suffering. Now there's lots of things that make people suffer, but this is just one of them, back pain and neck pain, but that's where, that's where I made my mark in life. This is where I can help people. I can't help with cancer, I can't help with diabetes, but I can help with back and neck pain. So I wanna help people. And that's why we do these broadcasts. All right, so we pretty much decompressed every foramen except for this one. We're almost done here, I can't see. That's the pedicle right there. And this foramen is pretty much open now. That's the nerve root right there. Show them the nerve root. Show them the nerve root. It's right here. See that white thing right there? Of course it looks red. But that's the nerve root right there. There's some veins on top of it. That's the left L5 nerve root, gel foam. So all the nerves are unpinched at this point. The Pretty much the four that I was worried about, five that I was worried about, which is L4, L5, S1, both sides. So I have done the decompression for stenosis. So somebody asked about stenosis earlier. That was stenosis that I just treated, okay? I treated it by unpinching the nerves. Stenosis means basically narrowing, and the narrowing causes a pinching of the nerves. So I just unpinch the nerves. What I've done will take away this patient's leg pain, weakness, numbness, completely take it away. But it will not take away their back pain. Their back pain, if I stop right now, will be horrible. So I have to do a fusion to, to take away their back pain. That's what I'm about to do. All right, any other questions you have? Let's yes. lower the volume a little bit. We have kind of a long one. We have right. a viewer who's saying, I'm a man, 6'5 and 465 pounds. I had a laminectomy done on my lumbar spine in the 80s that left me permanently weakened. I'm now 63 and I've been active and pushed through the complications of my prior surgeries. But now the adjacent, adjacent discs are protruding and degenerating. Is there any hope for a man my size? Yeah, 465 pounds is, is really not safe to do spine surgery on an outpatient setting. Um, so I would say you really should look at losing some weight and then come see me. But I can't operate on somebody who's almost 500 pounds. It's just not safe for you. In other words, I can do the surgery, sure, that's easy, but the risk of you having a complication being that overweight at 465 pounds is, uh, is substantial. Now, if you want me to give you a final opinion, yes or no, I would love to see you. We can do that with a Skype call. So what you should do is submit your MRI for review, it's free, and then ask to set up a Skype call. I need to look at your body and I need to see just how big you are. I mean, the fact that you're 6'5", I think you said, is helpful, but 465 pounds is too big. You won't fit on our operating tables, and you won't fit on most places' operating tables. The, the most powerful operating tables in the world hold up to about 500 pounds, maybe 600 max, and we don't have one of those operating tables. So we have an operating table that will hold up about 450, so you're over by 15 pounds. But honestly, I wouldn't even put a patient 450 on my table. I wouldn't go above 400 just for safety. All right, so if you could lose some weight, 
we could fix it for sure, but you'd have to lose about 100 pounds. <coughs> that can be done. There's little balls they can put in your stomach, gastric balls, little balloons. You should look into it. It's non-invasive. And uh, But if you want to know 100% for sure, just get a Skype call. It's all free. All right, at this point, I'm taking the, I'm going to do the uh, inner body fusion, and I'm going to take the disc out, and I'm going to put bone graft in there, and I'm going to put a cage in there. And I'm doing that because I want to correct the deformity and stabilize the segment. Look what a nice job the Joe Foam did, soaked in thrombin did, to stop the bleeding, right? I didn't have to put a bo bovie in there or a bipolar in there. It literally stopped the bleeding. So now here's your pedicle. The disc is going to be right here, wipe, and the nerve root is going to be right here. Can you see that? That's the nerve root, and the disc is here. I do not want a bipolar where the nerve root is. I want to be low in the foramen. That's the feet this way. The feet are down here. The head is over here. So if I cut the foramen in half, the top of the foramen is the nerve root. The bottom of the foramen is Camden's triangle or safe zone. I want to be in Camden's triangle. As long as you can see it like this and, and it's you know you're safe, you're not going to get the nerve root down here. Okay? I can actually see the outline of the nerve right there. Right? You see that? The right thing down there? Underneath, that's the nerve right there. So we want to stay underneath the nerve in Camden's triangle. If I do this, I can bipolar without worrying about hurting the nerve. I need to cut, I need to bipolar these veins because they're going to block my access to the disc. You have another question? Yes, we have one Scissor? more. Yeah. We have a viewer who says, I've had both my lumbar spine and cervical spine fused in the past, and my muscles in both areas are in constant pain. What can I do? All right, so a viewer has said, I've had both my lumbar spine fused and my cervical spine fused in the past. My muscles are in constant pain. Anyone know what I'm thinking? So to answer your question, yes, we can help you for sure. But anyone know what I'm thinking? If they're fused, they're not moving. So let's say the fusion has truly been done and they're not moving. So there's no pain from a disc. There's no pain from a facet. Why are they having pain? It's muscle. Why would they have muscle pain? This goes back to the point I made earlier. Alignment, 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 alignment. Alignment means the proper curves of your spine. Most surgeons don't fuse the spines in proper alignment. They're sloppy. They're not thinking about it. They don't care about it. They don't understand it. And that's become a huge topic lately in spine surgery is alignment. I've been doing it right for the last 20 years. That's because I know how important alignment is. I don't need someone else to tell me how important it is. I know how important it is. And um, as a matter of fact, with this particular patient, I remember talking to the medical director about alignment. And the medical director said, well, why do you need to do this reconstruction and put him in proper alignment? I said, because if I don't, he's going to be in chronic pain. So we actually had a disagreement. You know, he wanted to know angles and stuff. I'm like, I don't care about the angles. What I care about is whether the patient's going to have pain after surgery. So whoever that questionnaire is, I believe you may have muscle spasms, either from damage to the muscle or from alignment issues. Can we help you? I believe we can. So I would like for you to submit your imaging online to the free MRI review, and I will personally look at them, and I will do a video conference with you if you want, and I can tell you if we can fix your pain. But I truly need to see your imaging, which is your MRI, and I need to see uh, your, your body when I look at you on the video conference. I need to see where your pain is coming from. I would say there's at least a 50-50 chance we can fix the problem, 50-50. But I'm not saying have surgery on a 50-50 chance. I'm saying submit your MRI for review and do a video conference with a 50-50 chance. And after that, if I believe I can help you, I'll tell you it's a 100% chance or a 0% chance that I can help you, okay? So the first step would be to get your imaging in and to do a video conference with me. And that can all be done through a Duke Spine Institute app. So I recommend you download the Duke Spine Institute app online. We have it available for iOS, Apple's, as well as Android's platform. And with that app, you can submit your MRI and you can arrange for a video chat, okay? And by the way, we do that for anyone who wants it. It's not just this person. It's free. It's a community service. We do it as a charity for helping people. 
at no charge or cost to you. Go ahead. All right, so where am I? I'm in the neural foramen. I removed the lamina, I removed the facet that was abnormal. I'm in the back of the disc. There's a lot of scar tissue here and veins. I'm bipolaring the veins so they don't bleed. But look at all this scar tissue from the inflammation. All the dura is just scarred up. It should be perfectly white, not, not looking like this. So this is very abnormal. The nerve root, this is the left L4 nerve root, is literally right here coming off and it's covered in veins and it's going out the frame and I'm not messing with it. You start messing with that nerve root, that's when you get nerve damage from the surgery and I'm not gonna do that because I've never had nerve damage from the surgery. I don't wanna start today. So I'm just exposing the back of the disc. Again, very scarred up. I'm working underneath the nerve root. And by the way, we're monitoring these nerves all the time. We do intraoperative monitoring, 15 blade. So at this point, I'm ready to take the disc out. I'm going to start by opening the annulus by using a 15 blade. That's called a 15 blade. We have 11 blades that are pointy. We have 10 blades that are bigger for skin. I need more volume. This happens to be one of my favorite songs. If you want the Duke Spine soundtrack, just let us know. It's mostly classical rock. This is a Scorpions, Winds of Change. All right, now that I've opened the back of the disc, I want to clean out the disc material so I can do a fusion. So I'm going to use a rotating shaver and a mallet. You have to be very careful. I'm aiming medially because I want to get across the disc. You don't want to sink it beyond that spot right there. And then I'm twisting to clean out the disc material. Okay, so there's some of the disc material. Now I use a pituitary. To take out little fragments of disc. When we do the laser surgery, we don't do any of this open stuff. We come from the side here and go in. And I literally come in right in here where the herniation is. I use the laser to zap away this area. So we don't have to remove any of this bone. Eight, this is an eight millimeter flipper. How's our view on the first person? Sean? Yes. How's our first person view? Looks good. Good or great? It looks great. All right, well don't say it's great if it isn't great. If the anesthesiologist can see what I'm doing with the surgery, then it's great. Can you see what I'm doing? Have you ever done an outpatient 360 fusion with osteotomies? First time for you, huh? You look like you've been doing anesthesia for a while. How many years? 34 years? This is the wave of the future, my friend. We've been doing this here for five years, almost six years now. The first case I did was an intramedullary tumor in the spine attached to the conus, intradural. Patient went home two hours after surgery. Yeah. We've been doing things wrong all this time. All right, I'm right underneath the L4 nerve root. See, that's the nerve root. I'm literally underneath it. I'm bipolaring these little veins on the surface of the disc. Kerosene. Yep, now I'm going to open the annulus because if I don't do this right now, if I don't open this annulus more, our cage that we're going to put in will be too small. Now, Lori's got to protect the nerve root south. By doing that double move and then a kind of take in the middle, I've just given our cage another four to six millimeters in height. And other surgeons don't do it, by the way. That's a Duke spine technique. Let's make sure we don't capture the dura. Protect. So Lori's retractors are, are outside the annulus, but they're right underneath the dura, protecting the dura. 
All right, let's go with a bigger flipper. Now that we've opened the disc more, we're going to try to get a 10 millimeter wide rotating shaver in the disc space. By the way, I want you to notice something. When I open the disc space, look what happens to the whole spine. It moves. Uh -huh. This is why we do this. We want to shift the spine back into normal alignment. All right, I need an 8. I can't rotate the 10. Give me the 8 back. We're definitely not going to a 12, so don't even load a 12. Come on. It should already be there, guys. You're supposed to have the next size and the previous size. Nothing else. You only go up a size if I successfully shave. And I don't like to shave. I usually shave about once a week. Here. All right, next size up. <coughs> so you're looking down into the disc, guys and gals watching. We're literally, we're literally sinking this entire thing. And I got big hands. What is that, Lori, you think? Eight centimeters, seven centimeters into the disc. What I don't want to do is fracture. I don't want to fracture the end plate. So I want to take this to the limit. The limit being I don't want to fracture the end plate. But I don't think it's the end plate that's blocking it from shaving. I think it's a bone spur. So I got rid of it. All right, pituitary. That's a, as big as we're going to go. That was a 10 millimeter. Yeah, I would do a 14. Uh, actually, let's go. I don't believe 13 is a bad number. Uh -huh. Let's go with a 13 regular. A 13 to me is a lucky number. I'm sorry. If you live in Vegas, just close your ears. Uh. I don't believe 13 is unlucky. If you go to Vegas, you'll notice the hotels don't have a 13th floor. Yeah. Bipolar. Like seen See this finger? This is a bipolar finger. You gotta pay attention. Sorry, Lori. I was no, distracted. They don't have yeah, they don't have thirteen, period. Mm. I don't go to Vegas a lot, folks, but I did grow up in California. And uh, my uncle loves my uncles both love Vegas. Scissor. What's that? Huh? Yeah. Come on, scissor. Let's go. Scissor. My uncle just turned, I think he just turned 80. Yeah. yeah we used to go to Vegas when there's only like three hotels there back in the back in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. I need a kerosene. Come on, kerosene fine. Yeah, is he not able to see the surgery? I'm going to take a bite off that. What happened to our music? All right. Uh, that's not a problem. Not a problem. All right. So for those who are surgeons and want to know what I'm doing, Woodson, irrigation, Woodson. All right. So I'm going to moisten the dura. By the way, all the nerves that go down to the legs run right through this protective sac. This here, folks, is the pedicle of L5 on the left. That's a full pedicle. You can see the L5 nerve right there. You see the white? That's the L5 nerve. That's the dorsal root ganglion. And Lori is retracting the dura. That's the annulus right here, a posterior longitudinal ligament. This is the disc space of L45, L45. And we're doing something called an inner body fusion. It's where I come from the back, and I do the whole fusion in the front of the spine through the back. It's an advanced technique. Not many spine surgeons know how to do it, and even fewer know how to do it properly. I've taken the disc out at this point. Now I need to scrape the cartilage off the end plate so we can get a fusion. We haven't done the fusion yet. I've got to put bone graft in here. So if I want these bones to fuse together in this space, I need to scrape up the end plates and get rid of the cartilage. You're actually creating micro fractures. Right, I need a pituitary. 
I want to make sure I got all this large disc material large, out. Large. Yeah, always large at this stage. Oh yeah, there's a piece. See, that's why you got to fish. You got to fish to the other side. You want to get as much of that stuff out. All right, we're ready. So now we're going to start our fusion part. We're going to put bone graft called demineralized bone matrix. Okay. And then I'm going to take some of the patient's own bone. Not much bone here, Luis. What happened? Uh, well, it's actually thick per. Huh? Thick per case. I mean. No. Oh, you put some yeah, in the yeah, cage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what we have left for the inner body. Oh, we have we have a lot more. That's good yeah, enough. Yeah, the body. That's also good. All right. Good? Cage. I put the bone graft in for the fusion in the inner body space. This is called the transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion or T-lift. And now I'm going to put the cage in. Now because I did all that special extra work that other surgeons don't do, I can put a really tall cage in, which is going to help open the disc space up. I should be able to put a 14 in, but I'm not going to go for a 14. Take this. I'm going to go for a 13 because I don't want to get a little bit, I don't want to get too greedy. You know what I mean? If you get greedy, with this, you can actually fracture the end plate. And I, I just want to get the right size in. So I would love to get a 14, but I don't think a 14 is going to go. I think I'm going to have a time just getting the 13 in. So I'm taking some of these little bones first down off of the pedicle. All right, let's try again. So that little piece of bone was redirecting my cage in a way I didn't want it to go. That barely went. Thank God I did a 13, not a 14. Had I done a 14, right. I probably would have uh, uh, fractured the cage yeah, or the end plate. Impactor. Yeah, large impactor. So I want to advance and this to the front of the disc space. So I put an impactor in, and I'm basically going to give it a little wacky wacky to get it in. So that thing's not coming out. That's in solid. It's perfect. And honestly, you're not going to get a bigger cage than a 13 in there. And the only reason we got a 13 is because we did all that extra work that other surgeons don't do. So the other way you can get a big cage in, by the way, is going through the front of the spine. And to do that, you have to go through the belly. The going through the belly is very dangerous. But if I had gone through the belly, I could have gotten that, ca that size cage in or bigger. The problem with going through the belly, though, is it's very dangerous for the patient. You can injure all kinds of blood vessels and stuff. And have a much higher complication rate. So the biggest cage you're gonna get with a posterior approach is that 13 I just put in. So I'm very happy with that. And when we look at the x-rays in a minute, you'll see the alignment is beautiful. All right, what we have here are veins, okay? You got a good look at what the veins look like. They're purple. They're sitting right on top of the nerve and the disc. I don't need to sacrifice this vein because that's on the nerve, but I do need to sacrifice this vein because it's right over the disc space that I need to remove. All right, questions? No more yet. No question? Not now. The audience is slacking. You all should have questions for me. How often do you get a neurosurgeon standing by ready to answer your questions for free? Huh? One you haven't even met before, but over the internet. Maybe you're all just so mesmerized. That's okay. And some of you, I'm sure, are return viewers who have seen this before. And we've broadcasted every single surgery from the surgery center of Vieira Duke Spine Institute for the last five and a half years. So there's an archive out there on Facebook and YouTube of literally maybe a thousand surgeries that I've broadcast, all my surgeries. So I wonder if there's anyone who's watched every surgery besides me. See how if you don't bipolar the vein perfectly, it bleeds. 
and you really can't even see it there. It's so difficult to see, but you got to know exactly how to do it. Hey, Lori, nice job. Oh, let's show them the S1 nerve root. So, folks, the S1 nerve root is right here. Pretty cool, huh? Right there. See that white thing? That's the left S1 nerve root right there. Bam! Pretty cool, huh? Who else shows you the left S1 nerve root? Nobody. In all its glory. Yep, retract. So the, the next disc we're going to take care of is this L5S1. But just so you know, people ask me, hey, when you get in there, would you? There's no, hey, when you get in there, would you? The surgeries we do are all planned in advance. We know exactly what we're doing. Because you use the history, the physical, the MRI, the EMG, the X-ray and the CAT scan and the discogram if necessary. So there's nothing in the operating room you need to use to make a decision about the surgery. Uh, a good spine surgeon will know exactly what to do before they go to surgery, not during surgery. Now that changes if you have a tumor or a fracture or infection. But I'm talking about for a herniated disc or degenerative conditions, the spine surgeon should know. Now look at that, that herniation is real, it's right there. I didn't even appreciate that on the MRI. The MRI didn't look so bad, but the radiologist saw it and called it, and that's definitely pushing on the S1 nerve root. So I am really glad we're doing this because this is necessary to do. And that's probably part of the reason why there's so much stenosis. But long story short, if we were doing a laser surgery, I'd be doing this with a laser right now, and none of this opening would be here. Yeah, definitely a herniation is degenerated. All right, let's go with a rotating shaver, size eight. eight. Size eight. Everyone enjoying the broadcast? Huh? We're like the Wikipedia of spine surgery. No advertisements, no commercials. Just good, honest truth. Yeah, there's your disc, by the way. You can see how it's degenerated, the yellow stuff. That's not normal. Anybody want uh, crab meat for lunch? <laughs> so, a lot of people describe the disc as crab meat. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I, I suppose. Pathologists are always describing things by food. You know? All right, so we're at L5S1, and we're working underneath the L5 nerve root on the left and above the S1 nerve root. Bipolar. I'm going to need a, a bipolar, and then I'm going to need a kerosene 4 next. I may need a scissor. Scissors. One thing we like to do in neurosurgery is imitate our former bosses. My teachers, like Dr. Roten, Dr. Day at UF in Gainesville, or Dr. Roper. Suck! Damn it, suck! <laughs> Just kidding, I love Dr. Roper. All right, Kerosene 5. So for those of you who joined us late, we're doing a lumbar decompression, instrumentation, and fusion. This is the, the typical spinal fusion you hear about, but done in a very special way to have literally the best outcomes available in the world. All right, so I've opened it up nicely. I've taken the annulus. We're ready for the next size rotating shaver. This is going to go inside the disc and shave out the disc material. This is L5S1. I think we're going to do a short cage here. What is this, an 8 or a 10? So we did 8 first, and then this is 10. Well, I'm having a hard time with 10. Let me have, uh, almost got it, let me have an 8 back. I don't want to take any chances. So if you force that too much, if you don't know exactly the right amount, you can actually fracture the bone because it's metal versus vertebral body end plate. 
And I can guarantee you Meadow's going to win every time. Mallet. So you got to be really careful. Like if this was an osteoporotic patient with osteoporosis, I wouldn't be forcing it. But because this is a man who doesn't have osteoporosis, he's got good strong bones, I can be a little bit more aggressive. So I kind of use, remember we did the laminectomy earlier where I took all that bone out? I can feel how tough the bone is, how strong it is during that procedure. So I use that knowledge from the laminectomy to make determinations about the end plates and how much force I can use during this part. I want to go back to 10. Every good surgeon should be doing that, constantly uh, assessing and using information from one part of the surgery to guide other parts of the surgery. So when, you, when I talk about decisions aren't made during surgery, it's, you know, as far as what we're going to do isn't, um, doesn't change, but the little things like how hard I can twist this right now, that is something that I use. Like I make that decision in surgery based on information in surgery. But that doesn't, that doesn't change like the main part of the surgery. So, well, what was that, a 10? I want to do a 13 short. 13 short. What we're talking about is the cage I'm going to put in. So I'm going to use a shorter cage than, than the longer cage because the distance inside the disc from right here all the way to the front is shorter for this disc than it was for the last one. And if I use a normal length cage, Harrison 5, what's going to happen is I'm going to actually, the cage might protrude out a little bit, which we don't want. We don't want a protruding cage. That's very bad. You don't want the cage protruding. I mean, sometimes it happens after surgery, like the patient does something they're not supposed to do, bending over or twisting in a way they shouldn't before the, the, the spine is healed. I can't, I can't fix those, but I can certainly keep myself from putting in a cage that's not the right size. All right, that's good. Go rasp. So I've gotten all the disc material out that I can. Now I'm going to scrape up the end plates with this metal file and get all the cartilage off like we did last time. By doing this, this allows the bones to fuse together. My assistant, Lori, is doing a phenomenal job. And I know I have a, a new assistant coming. He's actually watching the surgery right now. And he is uh, signed on with Duke Spine Institute. Very excited to have him. He's excited to learn. Bone graft. That's called allograft. This is called autograft because it comes from the patient. This is the patient's own bone. I use a combination of autograft and allograft. I think that's the best. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. I'm not choosing just chocolate or peanut butter. Right? It's like fish and chips, not fish or chips. It's fish and chips. All right, let's go. Now we're going to put this cage in. It's shorter than the last one. It's packed with bone graft. And it's bullet shaped, tapered. And we're going to put this guy in. And this is going to help preserve alignment. Beautiful, absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. So now I'm going to advance it just a little bit. Look at that bleeding vein there. It's pretty cool, huh? All right. You want to be careful not to advance too much, otherwise you put it into the pelvis. Bipolar, my friend, bipolar. I need a bipolar because it's got a little vein to bleeding. This vein is underneath the nerve root, so I got to be really careful not to injure the nerve root. All right, that's perfect. Go foam and thrombin. All right, for those of you who have been with us, we've now done our decompressive laminectomies at L4 and L5. We've done our osteotomies. We've uh, done our inner body fusion, our inner body cage correction of deformity. About 90% of deformity correction has been done just with uh, ligamentaxis, which is just indirect distraction of the vertebral body. And now we are ready to put in some screws and rods. 
So I want to check everything and make sure the exposure is perfect. And that's going to be hard on this patient because they've got such narrow um, facet joints. Cobb. I mean, not, did I say narrow? I meant wide. wide. Yeah, I was wishfully thinking for narrow facet joints. But unfortunately, I didn't get them. So what limits the bottom retractor is your is the iliac crest, the bone right here. I would love to open it more and wider, but I'm hitting the bone. Um, but you can't see it, but it's underneath that muscle. So a patient's iliac crest will determine the width of which you can open the bottom retractor. The top retractor is really just determined by your fascial dissection. And um, I think we can take a little bit more off to help open it because I'm fighting it right now. And fascia, fascia doesn't move. I mean, it's tight. It's like, it's like a string or a rope, whereas the muscles are like an elastic band. So if I'm pulling against the muscles, I can get more, like more stretch. But with fascia, you don't get any stretch. There we go. You see how I got another click there? Mm -hmm. Bovie, hello, McFly. All right, so I want to see lateral to the joint. I want to see the transverse process, preferably, right here. I can feel it with the bovi. I know where to look, by the way. That's the mammillary process. It's perfect. That's the perfect place for a screw. Then I want to look here at the next guy right here. Show it to me, all of it. Yes. There it is. I want to bite that soft tissue off with a Luxo. Oh boy, come on man. My hand is gonna fall asleep. Oh boy, Luis, come on. Yeah. Anybody see it too? God, you guys are all a bunch of deadheads. Anybody see it too? It was great. It was really good. All right, here's where our S1 pedicle screw will go. The S1 screw is the easiest. I shouldn't say that. I probably just jinxed myself. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's going to go, like, right there. Like, right there. All right, now your side. So we want to be lateral to the facet. And we are. Left a little bit of nubbin of tissue. We should hit that. We got a little too much. I guess the contraction's okay. It's not horrible. I think we're okay. I know you need to do the EMG. Tuck here. But I'm fighting the muscles right now. But it's not bad. I need more volume on that radio because I cannot hear this. Is this, uh, I want my MTV? It's amazing I can hear that. That is a Lexel hand, my man. Damn right it is. Show me here. Show me. So right here. Beautiful. We have another question. Give me a second. All right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's good stuff, huh? Okay, let's get our uh, floral in and our table up. Oh, that's good stuff. Is that Peter Gabriel? Dire Straits, that's right. Wasn't he with Dire Straits at one point? I think we looked it up before, I don't think so. Okay, all right, no, no, that's okay. Chicks for free. I don't know, I don't think I'm gonna need a step up because he's skinny. Let's see. That's good. Let's bring the floral in. You got to bring this to the patient. All right, we'll take that question. We have a viewer who's asking, while using the instrumentation to fuse, why is bone graft still necessary? Yeah, so one of our viewers says, Dr. Duke, aren't you going to be fusing with the instrumentation? 
Why do you need bone graft? So great question. I remember when I started as a neurosurgery resident, I didn't understand the difference either. But uh, can we get the, floor on the, the fact of the matter is that instrumentation is not fusion. Think of instrumentation as being like a cast. A cast is not fusion. If you fracture your arm and you get put in a cast, the cast itself is an immobilization device. It's basically there to stop your bones from moving while they fuse together, but it's the bones that fuse. So instrumentation doesn't fuse. It literally anchors bones and fixes them in a specific place where they can fuse, but you still need bone graft to fuse. All right, so it's perfect. Nice job, everyone. Let me see if I need a step up. I probably do not. I'm going to try to do it without a step up. Genesis. Are you Ke Peter Gabriel was with Phil Collins? Yes, from 1967 to 1975. All right, I didn't know that. All right. This should be our entry point. Shot. Looks good. Let's try to align that end plane up a little bit better. I think you're a little bit wagged off. Try a three degree wag. I don't care which direction. I say my side south. Shot. Oh boy, that was three degrees? That was more than three degrees. Shot. Let's go. We got to move things along. You're taking too long. All right, that'll that that'll work. That'll work. That'll work. Let's leave it there. All right. You ready? So I'm drilling a hole in the cortex in the back where the mammillary process is, basically where the transverse process, superior facet, and residual pars are connected. All right, shot. All right, so I'm angling down a little too much, so I want to angle up, which is actually good, and I want to angle medial. So I'll show you what I'm doing in a minute, but basically I'm going through the pedicle shot into the vertebral body. Remember, this patient has abnormally short pedicles to begin with, okay? And they're pretty skinny. So, all right, we got hy hypoplastic pedicles. Please add that at L4, hypoplastic, hypoplastic. H-Y-P-O-P-L-A-S-T-I-C. Very skinny. So I think this is going to be a 6-5 screw. Yeah. Okay. Normally we do a 7-5. That's 7.5 millimeters. So you never want to go the tip past two-thirds of the way. That's two-thirds of the way. We're at a 40. 6-5, 40. So 40 is the length. I'm going to take this guy out. All right. And then we're going to tap. Tap, five, five, tap. Five, five. Thank you. All right, so I'm tapping, shot. Tapping is basically creating the threads in the pedicle for the pedicle screw. Shot. Hey, what's going on here? You guys got to set this properly. Shot, do you understand? The collar has to be down. Yeah, never put your collar up. Collar up is preppy. We don't do preppy here, okay? That's 280s for me. <sighs> I try to make jokes, folks. I try to make it humorous. I really do. It's not for lack of effort. Here you go. So now I'm going to sound the pedicle hole with this little ball. You all see this? You all see that? So I'm going down, making sure we're not poking out. Oh, yeah, it feels like the aorta. No, that's bad. Okay? You want to be inside bone the whole time, and we are. So there's no breach. We call it a breach. Kind of like when a whale comes up and breaches the surface of the water. We don't want to breach the surface of the pedicle. Shot. There's your screw going in the pedicle. It's a beautiful thing. 
See that, guys and gals? That is a pedicle screw. Beautiful. This uh, little invention here I didn't make. I didn't create it, but we've been using them. I've been using them for 22 years now. The pedicle screws came into being when I was in my residency. Prior to that, uh, well, the polyaxial pedicle screws. Prior to that, surgeons, when I started residency back in 1997 at UF in Gainesville, we had one of the top spine programs for training and surgery in the world. And they were just still doing rods with like pedicle hooks and laminar hooks and clamps and stuff was garbage. It was so miserable. But now with this new stuff, like with the heads to turn and rotate in different angles and degrees, yeah, polyaxiality, that was created by a guy named Mendelssohn, Mickelson, sorry, Mickelson. Anyway, the guy's a multi-billionaire now. But look at that, see? Now that can move to where the rod is. Yeah. It's a million times better than the old Lukey system. Yeah, oh my gosh. The Lukey stuff was so bad. But I, I did cases on it when I started. Cobb. So I know what it's like, and I know how to take it out. But I, I would never put it in. Sorry, Lukey. Nothing personal. Suck here. You just didn't advance with the times. All right. So here's the next one. Right at the base of this facet where the transverse process meets. Let's just see. Lateral shot. That looks pretty damn good, right? Yep. Just getting compression now from this uh, muscle. I need the uh, pedicle finder. So I got to slide down the pedicle with this thing. And boy. shot, I want to make sure my trajectory is good, it is good. And the most important thing, folks, with this, if you're going to do this kind of surgery, is just let it go. Like, let it feel its way and guide it. But don't force it. Just little taps like that shot. And the other important thing is twisting. Little twists like this. You see that twist down there? Twist and shout. Okay? It's like old dance move. Just let it twist a little bit. Boy, this is longer. Shot, 45, it looks like. Yeah, this is a 45. I'm going to say 6545. Yeah. <coughs> Take. Tap. Hello, you got to have that tap ready, man. You can't start looking for it when I give you the instrument. You have to be prepared. Luis, let's have a talk, please. A little pep talk about being prepared. What's next? Shot? That's damn right it is. So let's have it in your hand, ready to go. Don't start looking for it when I give you this instrument back. Of course it's your fault. It's not my fault. Shot? So you got the right screw? You got it. I love it. Locked and loaded. Well, for those of you who follow us regularly, you all know that Arius, my son, he just turned 15. And he is uh, the number one driver of cars in the United States in his age group. He's a national champion racing go-karts. And he's been signed with a professional sports agency that has 300 athletes worldwide, mostly football and basketball and baseball players. But they've just started a motorsports division this year, and Arias is the first driver they signed. I just got a, a uh, text from the director of motorsports, and they have found what they believe is the right sponsor for him, hopefully for the rest of his career. So we're going to be going up to Chicago in January to meet the sponsor. And if they like him, and he's a likable kid, as long as he's not around his sister, then uh, then hopefully they'll move forward with the sponsorship.
could be the first Formula One driver that's of American descent in the last 30 years shot. Of course, there was um, Scott Speed, who's a friend of mine. He was the last American to drive Formula One for Red Bull. But he's retired from Formula One less than one season. All right, so that's our screws at L4, and they're perfect. You see that, how the tips come right under the, uh, hello, how the tip of the screw comes right under the end plate? And uh, they're in the middle of the pedicle. They're two-thirds of the way in. That's as good as it gets. Look at the cage, by the way. Look at that nice curve we got between L4 and L5. We got about, what, five, six degrees of lordosis there? Maybe eight. It's looking good. So cages are perfect. Screws so far are perfect. All right. All right, so we just drilled a little hole in the pedicle of L5, and I gotta get this pedicle finder behind this cerebellar retractor because the retractor wants to push my pedicle finder to the wrong trajectory, and I don't want that. I'm not gonna let anything push my instrument out of the way. Don't, as a surgeon, you can't do that, shot? Yeah, you can't let things change what you wanna do. You, you have to understand the relationship between these different structures during surgery. Shot, we've got about 30 minutes. So we got about another 15 minutes of screws and rods, and then 15, 20 minutes to close. So save 45 minutes, we should be completely closed. Is it really 12.30 already? Crap. So by 1.15. Shot, how did the discogram go for you this morning? Did you do the do do the disc around, right? This is a 40. I want to do 7540. 7540. Take. Come on. Come on. When I hand this, you can't delay. You got to take and hand. That's the um 65 tap. I see that. Shot. Yeah, she's got three levels. She, uh, she needs surgery. Any questions from our audience? We have one question. A viewer asks, if you have surgery, what are the chances of failure above or below the disc? One of our viewers says, if you have spine surgery, what's the chance of failure above and below the disc, above and below the operated level? All right, so that's a really good question. And the answer I'm going to give you is really complex because it's the truth, and the truth is complicated. Shot. If the surgeon treats all the levels that need to be treated with that first surgery, the chance of needing another surgery of failure above or below is about 1%, which is my, my failure rate. And my need for additional surgery in fusion cases is 1%. Go ahead, Lori, finish it. But the problem is most surgeons, here's what I've learned. This whole notion of adjacent segment disease is truly, honestly, the fault of the surgeon about 98% of the time. And the reason for that is the surgeon should have fixed two discs with the first surgery, but they only fixed one. So the second disc, of course, it's going to become symptomatic in the future. And of course, you're going to need another surgery for that second disc. And honest to God, I've seen rates of adjacent segment disease of as low as 5%, but mine is 1%, so it's even better. And I've seen it as high as 40 or 50% in the literature. It just depends on the surgeon reporting it. But the, the honest truth is that it really depends on, I need suction, I can't see. It really depends on whether the surgeon did the right surgery in the first place. So if the surgeon did the right surgery in the first place, the chance that you're gonna need another surgery is about 1%. That's the best I've ever seen it, large bite. 
and those are the patients at Duke Spine. So there's two things that are done wrong that increase the likelihood of needing more surgery, a second surgery, adjacent segment disease. The first is what we call under-treating. It means not doing both or three discs when you should have done two or three discs to begin with. Bob. The second is not fusing in proper alignment. So if the surgeon leaves your spine in kyphosis, then you're going to end up needing another surgery because you're going to wear out the discs above or below. And that's really why my, my surgery, my adjacent segment disease rate is so low at 1% is because I always treat all the discs that need to be treated with the first surgery, which is why my average is actually two and a half discs treated per surgery. And I always correct the alignment and make it good. Shot. So as long as the surgeon properly aligns the spine during fusion, and as long as the surgeon treats all the discs that need to be treated with the first surgery, the chance you're going to need a second surgery and have se symptomatic adjacent segment disease, in my experience, is less than 1%. Now, that's not what you see reported in the literature, and that's not what other surgeons say, and that's because in their hands, their results are much worse. We got a little pumperoni. Uh, I need a bipolar. Do I have a bipolar pedal somewhere? Can somebody step on my bipolar pedal for me? I need a bipolar. And on. On. There's a little artery right there. Yep. Stay on it. So our blood pressure must be going up a little bit. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I like that, 86. We just had a little, um, remember, the blood vessels to these facet joints are abnormal, right? We already talked about that. They're abnormally enlarged and there's abnormally more of them because of the uh, chronic arthritis going on in the facet joint. It, it basically releases off. It releases um, little molecules that are called cytokines, and they call for more blood vessels to grow in. All right, so we got a 6540, right? 6540? Yep. Tap. Nice job. Did I finish answering that question? I think I did. So the, the person asked, what's the chance of adjacent segment disease? And I told them it's 1% when done right at Duke Spine Institute, and it's on average about 25% nationally. And that's because most surgeons only do one disc when they needed to do two or three. And they just have you come back like an annuity. That way they can uh, you know, keep making money off you over and over again. I try to fix people the first time so uh, they don't have to keep coming back. Uh, my my reoperation rate, whether it's laser surgery or fusion, is 1%. So 1% of my laser surgeries come back and need a second surgery, and 1% of my fusion surgeries shot, come back. That's for lumbar fusions. Cervical fusions is probably around 1% as well. It's certainly not higher. Shot. So I'd say all around fusions, open surgery is 1% at Duke Spine, and laser surgery 1%. They're both the same. So this screw is going in, shot, and it's going in nicely. And this is L4. Go ahead, Lori. Got to give Lori her workout for the day. She likes putting the screws in. Oh, you usually go in the morning? Cobb, small? All right, so while you're doing this, you got to make sure you don't trap your other screw. You didn't. You're fine. And you got to make sure you don't disconnect here. Otherwise, that can pop out, go right into the dura. That's good. Oh, you're done. You're done. All right, we got two more screws to put in, folks, at S1, and we're done with screwing. And then we're going to stimulate the screws and then put rods in. All right, let's go with a drill. Great questions, by the way, from our audience today. As usual. Shot. Now these guys got small pedicles at S1. You can see them. 
They're tiny, but accessible. We have another question. Sure. We have a viewer who's wondering, why are discograms sure. so painful? Why are discograms so painful? That's an interesting question. Hmm. Let me see this trajectory. I wasn't happy with that. Let's see if I'm happy with this. Um, why are discograms so painful? Well, honestly, the fact that a discogram causes pain is a good sign. It means we know where your pain's coming from. It's coming from a disc. Um, so discograms are only painful when there there's a painful disc. If you don't have a painful disc, the discogram shouldn't be painful. I'm going to go bicortical shot. So I'm going out the front of the spine with the tip because I want to get better purchase because he's got a very narrow sacrum. So I'm going to go with a a 40, 6540 sacral. So I kind of went through the bone in the front because by getting that front of the sacrum purchase shot, we call it purchase, where you grab bone, where the screw grabs the bone is called the purchase. It's the strength of that screw bone interface. You want it as strong as possible. Shot. So the more purchase you can get with the screw on the bone, the more stable the construct is, the longer it's going to last. You, it's less likely to fail. You don't want to fail your effusion because the hardware fails. If the hardware fails and gets loose before the spine fuses, you could end up with a situation where you have a failed fusion. And that can cause you know problems like pinched nerves and pain. So we don't want a failed fusion. So I want to go for as much stability as I can get with the instrumentation. Irrigation, shot. So that's, that's my discogram answer. I mean, the discogram is only painful when there's a painful disc. Unless, of course, the procedure itself was painful, like just sticking the needle in your skin. But for that, I mean, it shouldn't really be painful. Come on. Yeah. Can you see it, Lori? Finish it. All right, we got one more screw to go at S1 on the right side, and we'll be done. Now, I'm going to stimulate these screws with electricity next. Let's get that ready, please. And I'm going to make sure that the screws aren't touching the nerves. That's what the stimulation with electricity does. Keep going. So when you stimulate a screw with electricity, it runs electric current down the screw, which is metal, and then it goes out and activates the nerve next to the screw first. If it activates the nerve, is it, let me see, is, yeah, it, is it in? Yeah. Shot? Perfect, bicortical. If the electricity activates the nerve too early, it means the screw is touching the nerve. If the, uh, and that's usually below 10 milliamps. If the electricity activates the screw above 10 milliamps, then it's not touching the nerve likely. All right, I need suction. You see over here, oh, okay. you see over here. It's that little pimp dimple right there that I'm looking for. That tells me where the pedicle is. Okay, you're good. Why is this all stuck here? Whoa, whoa, whoa! What's wrong with Californication? Oh, sorry. How about under the bridge? Two songs back. Because I really didn't get to listen. All right. So this is interesting. Shot. I like my entry point. It's a little bit low. I can't tell if it's low because we're not lined up with the end plate. Let's line the end plate up. Just try a little wag, a little bit. I think we may be okay. Just a little bit in a shot. That is maybe worse. Let's go back. Yes, you have a question? Yes, we do. One of our viewers is wondering, what is your opinion on the closing of the Laser Spine That's Institute nice. in Tampa, and how is your technique different yeah. from theirs? Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to talk to my team. Let's bring the fluoro south. Is this good? Yeah, and let's get another shot. But by moving south, we're changing the parallax. Let's go ahead and wag it the same way you did to get the good correction. Because I can see the iliac crests are completely off. You know, the pelvic. 
Uh, that's, is that what you did before? We need to go further south then. That looks pretty good. What do you think, Lori? I like that. That looks good. Lock it down. It's still a little off on the pelvis, but it's better than it was. Show me here, over here. I think that's the hole. Sean, I'm going to answer your question in a minute, but I just got to uh, see how much better it is right there. All right, I'm going to just have to. So what's happening is the retractor blade is forcing me like this. If I do this, I'm going to end up going out. So I need to do something to fix this. So I'm actually going to try to manipulate. Suck, please. Right there. Perfect. Now I'm outside the blade. You see how I did that? All right, shot. All right, perfect. So I'm happy with that. I'm going in. Um, give me a second. I'll answer your question. Shot. All right, good. So we're going to come out through the front again. Shot. Want to believe I'm all alone. Is it six? Uh, what do we do? Six five or seven five? Let's do a six five forty again. Six five forty. I need a five five tap. Quickly. Don't sleep. I need the tap. Yeah, that's what we said. Sometimes when I feel surgery gets too easy, I like to challenge myself. Shot. I let my staff fall asleep on the job, and then it kind of mixes things up a little bit. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. <laughs> ah. My wife says, there's an element of truth to every one of your jokes. All right. We're ready to put the last screw in. This is a sacral screw. It's going into the tailbone. Shot. Flory, have at it. All right, drop the table, floral out. Can we watch the arms, please, with the floral? So basically, what do I think about the closing of Laser Spine Institute? I think it's a tra tragedy. I think it's a travesty and a tragedy. Yeah, sure, Laser Spine Institute had its problems, right? But. Um, the quality of surgery there was not at our level at Duke Spine Institute. It never was. It never would be. But it was still better than many other places. And it offered people an opportunity to have some minimally invasive surgery done. Now, that, that said without actually talking about the procedures that they did, because what they really did there, Lori, you're killing me. What they actually did there was a microdiscectomy. That's really what they did. They did microdiscectomies. But they did it with a, you know, with a smaller incision. And that's all they did different was a smaller incision, okay? So you could really have that procedure done pretty much anywhere by a good spine surgeon. Um, I don't know that their results were any better, but they certainly weren't treating back pain except with their pain management procedures and their fusions. But still, I think any time um, a, a spine center that does good, for, for the most part, good work, closes down due to financial reasons from okay, reimbursement issues primarily. I know there was a lawsuit yes. that they were hit with, but they were getting declining reimbursements. That's really what the main reason they closed down. The insurance that's companies weren't work. paying. I think that's a, a, a tragedy. So. Um, yeah, 70. I don't know if that answers the 70. question. I don't think it's a 70. I think we're at like a 50 or a 60. All right, you want to try 60 Let's try 60. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I don't know if you're asking, looking for something specific for me to comment on. Um, I can comment on something specific if you have something specific. I know that they started doing fusions at LSI over the last few years. 
because they wanted to in increase their reimbursements because they had a big overhead. I need a bender, guys. What comes after sizing is bending, okay? It's always bending. Come on, Luis. So was that, do, did that answer the question? Definitely locked up. Locked up. Yes. They also asked how your technique differed from theirs, but I think you kind oh, of answered that too. Yeah, the technique difference is huge. So Laser Spine Institute made this kind of an incision, just smaller, about that big. They went down right here, they hit the bone, and they actually drilled a hole in the bone to get down to the nerve, and then they did a discectomy and foramenotomy. Okay? Very standard, traditional surgery, been around for 100 years. What I do that's different with, a la with my laser surgery is I come from the side here. I don't come through the middle, I come from the side. By going through the side, I pass through the muscle and I go through that hole right there, the neural foramen, and I get right into the disc and I do the laser surgery on the disc. There's no bone removed, there's no big incision. It's all done with a tiny incision. Right. Hold on. Differences, no muscle damage, no bone damage, no joint damage, and a much better yeah, surgery. Cool. Because they can't get inside the disc and do an annular debridement like I can. And the annular debridement is what takes away the pain. So very, very different surgery. All right, now we got a rod. We're going to connect these screws together. So remember, we call this part of the surgery the instrumentation. This is not the fusion. The fusion is where we put bone graft in. The instrumentation is where we put instrumentation in. Bender. I'm not happy with the curve of the rod. I want to bend it more. I want to give more lower doses. All right. So by giving more lower doses, I basically create a better curve for the patient. You understand? That's important. This patient has to have a good curve. Remember we talked about adjacent segment disease before. Set screw. The reason people get adjacent segment disease is because the surgeon didn't operate it when they should have with the first surgery, but also they get it because the curvature of the spine is not set right during the fusion. That's probably the second most common reason. I was thinking we haven't heard this song. Yeah, November Rain is, it's on every surgery. Yeah. It's like part of the equipment we use for the surgery is an iPod, iPod or whatever with November Rain. Guns and Roses. All right, so we did one rod on one side. I'm gonna need the bender next. Now we're going to do the rod on the other side. And by the way, this part of the surgery used to take a good hour to bend the rod properly before there were polyaxial heads, before Mickelson's invention. So he deserves his money. You ever do lumbar fusions anywhere? Where? So, three different places. You were in Vanderbilt? When did you leave Vanderbilt? When did you leave? So it was a long time ago. Yeah, one of my compadres went to Vanderbilt to do vascular, neurovascular, Robert Miracle. That was my favorite resident that I was co-resident with, then attending. Medium he size. was so funny. Medium size. We, we loved hanging out and doing surgery together. All right, so now we're going to put a crosslink in. Because, sta uh, mallet, because basically these screws and rods give good stability for flexion extension, but not for rotation. So I don't want this patient's spine rotating through the fused area, or s instrumented area while it's fusing. So to prevent rotation, I'm using a crosslink. And I, I'm probably just going to do one crosslink. One, just one. Just one. All right, so you see step screwdriver, only driver. Yeah, medium's fine, Luis. I tell you otherwise. My silence means it's fine. <laughs> I want my silence all the time too, trust me. 
If I'm silent, it means you guys are doing your job right. All right. We're going to tighten all this stuff up. Sorry, Lori. It's just kind of tight here, so I want to... Yeah. Nothing against you or your ability. Oh. By the way, the, the big cage going down here is a counter, counter torque wrench. And the idea is to help tighten the screws without torquing all the hardware out of place. So you, you need to use it when you tighten the lumbar screws especially. You don't need it for cervical screws but the lumbar screws, you need it. Done. And it's got a tension limiting device, so where it'll literally snap when you hit the right tension on the torque. So you know you're not under torquing the set screws, you're torquing them properly. Because the, the manufacturers of the system build in a release on the device when I hit that um, proper amount of torque force. Oh, I'm not engaged. It wasn't that hard. There it is. How long do you need to close? 15? Yeah. We'll be closed in 15 minutes, doctor. Okay. All right, we'll do the cross link real quick. So we always tighten the arms first, and they get intention limiting. Let's do it. So that's about as clean of a complex spine surgery case you'll ever see. Great job, everybody. Great job. All right, I'll head over to the um, control room as Lori closes. And I'll answer some more questions for you all.
Okay, Dr. Duke Majin, back with you, as I promised I would be. Are you guys still watching the closure? Okay, so uh, while Lori is just closing up, my closure means we're putting sutures in to pull everything back together that we opened up. She's putting a drain in so that that'll drain any of the juices uh, so they don't accumulate under the skin and get infected. So the drain is very helpful in preventing infections. Um, so she's closing up. She should be done in about 10, 15 minutes. In the meantime, we're going to take some questions here. Uh, first one is, if a discogram is not painful, what is the next step? Great question. So all back pain comes from a known structure. I will just start by saying that. Okay. Now, the problem is, is that most people that treat back pain, about 98% of them don't know the structures that cause back pain. They literally don't know. So let me give you an example. Let's say your house is on fire, right? And you don't know why. You don't know why. It's simple. You don't have the knowledge, the experience, the tools that are necessary to make the diagnosis as to why your house caught on fire. So an expert comes in. That expert is called a uh, fire chief, okay? And a fire chief's job is to figure out why a fire happened. And there's reasons for that, okay? Um, there's safety reasons, which we all like to go up believing the fire chief is there to protect us from ourselves, right? Don't smoke cigarettes in bed when you have oxygen going on your nose. If you have uh, COPD, right? Don't smoke cigarettes when you're laying in bed with oxygen. Why? Because the cigarette's going to catch the oxygen on fire and your house is going to burn and you will die. So the fire chief's job is to figure out why fires happen. They're an investigator. Think about spine doctors as being investigators. First and foremost, our job is to investigate. And what I'm trying to tell you, very simply put, is that most spine doctors are horrible investigators. Horrible. They don't have the knowledge, the experience. It would be like taking a fire chief investigator from a little town in, you know, rural United States that has uh, like three houses made out of wood and a barn and bringing them to New York City and saying, okay, what caused this sky rise to burn down? And they're going to look at you and go, the how the hell am I supposed to know? I mean, look at all the sophisticated electronic equipment. I don't know. So only the very simplest causes of fires could that poorly educated, poorly experienced fire chief figure out is the cause of the fire. It takes someone with tremendous experience and knowledge and skill in it to be able to determine the cause of the fire in a very complex situation like in a in a uh, uh, skyscraper in Manhattan, okay? So spine care is no different. It's like that 98% uh, of spine doctors, chiropractors, physiotherapists, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, physiatrists, anesthesiologists, you name it, 98% of them cannot figure out why your back hurts. They will not be able to pinpoint the cause. 98%. That means... 98% of the people out there in the world with chronic back pain that go to their doctor are not going to get the right cause. So I want you to digest that for a moment. That is the problem that has gone on in spine care, back pain, neck pain for the last 50 years. And it's still a problem in the year 2019, about to be 2020. So how is it that 2% of the spine doctors can figure out where pain comes from. The reason is that those 2% have had the exposure, they've taken the interest, whatever the reason is. It's something to do with caring enough to figure it out. That's really what it comes down to in plain English. Caring enough to figure it out. So those 2% of spine, care, spine doctors that care enough to educate themselves by traveling around the world, meeting with the best surgeons and doctors, and studying their techniques, how they treat patients, what they do. That's what I had to do to become what I am. It wasn't a product of my training and residency. That was only maybe 25% of it. I actually had to travel around the world and go to meetings for years 
and study other surgeons' patients, their outcomes, their surgical technique, how they treated patients. That's where I learned. T meeting with chiropractors, talking to chiropractors, understanding what chiropractors do, talking to physical therapists, meeting with them, understanding what they do, how, what they treat. It basically was a massive learning undertaking that I went through individually by myself with the help of other doctors and professionals in each one of them gave me a piece of the puzzle. And in the end, I was able to put together the entire jigsaw puzzle. And I was able to understand how all the components of the back work together and which ones cause pain and how they cause pain and how to treat them. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you ask me this question of if a discogram is not painful, what's the next step? What you're really asking me is how do you figure out what's causing the pain if if the discogram is negative. In other words, what you're asking me is, if the disc herniation is not the cause of the pain, because the discogram is negative, then how do you figure out what's causing the pain? Well, the first step is to know the causes of pain, to literally be able to list them. And the next step is to be able to identify which causes of pain are there in that patient. Because every patient has a different combination of causes of pain. For example, did you know that there's a joint at the bottom of your spine called the sacroiliac joint? It's where your tailbone, the last bone in your spine, connects to your iliac bone, which is your pelvic bones, right? And your pelvic bones connect to your hips and down to your femur and your leg. So all the weight of your body is transmitted through the sacroiliac joints, left and right, down into your legs. Well, those sacroiliac joints do get painful. They get arthritis and they get painful. Most doctors don't know that. When I was trained at University of Florida in Gainesville, one of the top neurosurgery training programs in the country, in the world, I was not trained on sacroiliac joint, period because nobody paid attention to it. We didn't know about it. We didn't understand how important it was. Nobody really cared about it. It was ignored by the neurosurgeons that did spine surgery. Now, today, I realize that it accounts for 10% of chronic back pain. And it's a very important source of back pain. And if you don't identify that in a patient and treat it properly with the proper treatment, which is injections of steroids and therapy, if you don't do that right, the patient is going to continue to have chronic pain in their back. So the question that's being asked of me is, Dr. Duke, if the discogram is not painful, so if it's negative, and the disc is not the source of the back pain, what's the next step? It means, what's next? Well, the next step would be to figure out what is causing the patient's back pain. So what are the candidates? The most likely candidate would be a facet joint, F-A-C-E-T joint. And we have literally 10 of them in our lower back. So it could be one, it could be two, it could be all ten that are causing pain. And the way they cause pain is through inflammation from arthritis. So the reality is, is that if the disc is not the cause of the pain, there's other things that are the cause of the pain, okay? And they range from fractured vertebrae to facet joint inflammation, sacroiliac joint infl inflammation, piriformis muscle inflammation, coccygeal ligament inflammation, uh, even an aortic aneurysm can cause back pain. Kidneys can cause back pain with a pyelonephritis or a cystitis, which is inflammation of your bladder. You could have a hydroureter causing back pain, which is a swelling of the ureter from the bladder to the kidney due to obstruction. It could be kidney stones causing back pain. It could be a uh, fracture of the bone, like the vertebral body. It could be a tumor. It could be an infection, all right? It could be discitis. There's lots of things that cause back pain, but it's not unlimited. It is limited, and certain things are more common than others, okay? There's an old saying, if you hear hoofbeats, don't look for a zebra. Look for a horse. Horses are much more common than zebras, at least here where we live in the United States they are. All right, next question. Hold on. A viewer asks, do you have any opinions about Dr. Varun Leohasprasit in Washington State? He is also a neurospinal surgeon. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name. All right. So someone's asking me, do you have any opinion about another uh, neurosurgeon? 
who does spine surgery in Washington State? The answer is no. I've never heard doc of Dr. Varun Lehaprasit ever before. This is the first time. So I have no opinions about him. Our next question. One of you asks, how long after fusion can normal activities resume without the concern of muscle spasms? Okay, very good question. Hold on one second. Okay, um, so our next question as stated, sorry about that, was how long after fusion can normal activities resume without concerns of muscle spasm? Um, that's a great question. The problem is every human being is different. I've done fusions on people where they have zero muscle spasms from day one. They wake up from surgery, they have no muscle spasms. And I have other people that have muscle spasms that last for a couple of months. Um, I'll tell you that the most important factors that determine how long you have muscle spasms for are number one, the surgeon and the surgery, the way they do the surgery, that's the most important. And um, most surgeons cause a lot of damage to the muscles during surgery, during spinal fusions, that's just a fact. And they don't know how to take care of the muscles properly. Because of that, they kill the muscles. And when you look at MRIs after surgery, you'll see that the muscles are dead. There's all scar tissue there. I have countless patients that come to me from other surgeons that did their back surgery, and they're in chronic pain, and the pain is coming from all the scar tissue from the surgeon killing the muscle. Now, the surgeons are taught not to even care about the muscle. They don't even realize the muscle is important. Most of them have no clue how important the muscle is. So they end up damaging the muscle while they go in, and then they retract the muscle for too long, and the muscle dies. Listen, if, um, if you take one of your organs and you cut off the blood supply, guess what's going to happen? It's going to die, all right? Look at gangrene. Diabetics don't get enough blood flow to their leg. The leg clots off. They don't get any blood flow for more than a couple of hours. The leg dies. It's called gangrene, right? Frostbite. If you have too cold to your finger, you don't get any circulation, the fingertips die. So we get dying tissue from not enough blood flow. Um, it happens in many different ways, but in surgery on the back it can happen too. When the surgeon pushes over the muscles, the muscles don't get any blood flow during that pushing over part. We call it retraction. Well, if you hold that tissue over for too long, retracting it, the muscle dies. And that's what I see all the time from these spine surgeons that do back surgeries. They kill the muscles inadvertently just by not being aware and not being able to operate fast enough. So slow surgeons, surgeons that don't pay attention to the muscle, cause massive damage to the muscles which during the surgery, and then you're going to end up with muscle spasms for years afterwards, maybe the rest of your life. That's why I broadcast these shows, is to show people the right way to do surgery and the right way is to not retract the muscles for too long. Too long is more than two and a half hours. Muscle, skeletal muscle dies when it doesn't get any blood flow for two and a half hours. Okay? So really pay attention to this issue. It's very important. Um, so when you ask me how long do the muscle spasms last, it depends on, number one, how much muscle damage was there during your surgery. Muscle spasms should only last about two weeks. Two weeks. 
if your muscle spasms last longer than two weeks, then either you're not getting the right therapy done or your surgeon killed your muscles during surgery. And, you know, that's something you should avoid at all costs because those muscle spasms after back surgery can be there the rest of your life. You wish you didn't have back surgery done. I see patients like that all the time. Not my patients, but they come from other surgeons. So my best advice to you is go somewhere like Duke Spine Institute where you know you're going to get the very best care in the world and you're not going to have chronic muscle spasms as a result of the surgeon. Okay? The second reason people get it is they go to and get the wrong therapy done. So they go to a physiotherapist that doesn't do the right stretching, they don't do the right massage, they don't do the right uh, rehabilitation of the muscles in the back. Happens all the time. We have a therapy group here at Duke Spine that knows exactly what to do. And that's something that we try to help our out of, out of the country and out of state patients by doing video chats now with our therapist. The head of therapy is Dr. Schrumpf. And she does these video conferences with them and that helps them. But generally speaking, you need the right therapy after your back surgery, otherwise you're gonna have chronic muscle spasms. So how long can they last? They can last years. If not, surgery not done properly or therapy not done properly, okay? Next question. Our next question is, if you have been solidly fused at L4-5, L5-S1, would you ever be able to golf again? So, great question. One of our viewers says, hey, Dr. Duke, if someone's fused at L4-5, L5-S1, like this patient I just did, will they ever be able to golf again? 100% yes, as long as the surgery is done properly. Again, all my answers to you, if you've noticed a trend, depend on whether the surgery is done the best that it can be done or whether you're getting an average back surgery done by an average surgeon. If you have this Duke Spinal Fusion, like the guy had today, he's going to be golfing in two weeks. Two weeks. Okay? Now, he's not going to be able to drive in two weeks. He's gonna, it's going to take probably about three months before you can drive the ball. So you're losing your golf game, basically your full golf game, for three months. But uh, had Tiger Woods come to me first for his back surgery, he would have been basically golfing within three months. He never would have lost his game, and he would have literally not lost a billion dollars in revenue that he did. It's sad, but it's absolutely true. And um, they're just not all spine surgeons are created equal. Tiger Woods had four back surgeries, and now he's doing well after the fourth one. But, you know, think about it. He didn't just go to average spine surgeons. He went to supposedly the best. Um, but that's what you get when you go to supposedly the best as opposed to going to the best. So I would caution you, if you're considering golfing after your back surgery, make sure you get the right back surgery done by the right surgeon. Our next question is, can lumbar fusion cause sacroiliac pain? All right, so this is a really good question. I'm glad somebody asked it. Can lumbar fusion surgery cause sacroiliac joint pain? The answer is no. Lumbar fusion surgery itself cannot cause sacroiliac joint pain. However, many patients with lumbar fusion surgery develop sacroiliac joint pain. It's not from the surgery per se itself. It's usually from the recovery. It's from doing the wrong exercises or not doing the right exercises. It's from wearing the back brace after surgery that you need to wear for six weeks. That back brace is going to shift your posture. It's going to shift the way you stand and walk, and it can actually cause you to um, kind of put too much pressure on one SI joint, which is going to cause that SI joint to get inflamed. So you can develop sacroiliac joint dysfunction, or we call it sacroiliitis, which is inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. That can happen as a result of back surgery, but it's not directly from the back surgery. It's not from the lumbar fusion. So the lumbar fusion itself doesn't result in a sacroiliitis or sacroiliac joint inflammation, but it's the op post-operative care. It's the wearing the back brace, doing the exercises, changing the way you're walking and standing. You know, those things cause the sacroiliac joints to act up. And we actually see that even in my patients that I do perfect fusions on. They'll come back. Many of them will have sacroiliac joint inflammation. It's temporary, and we treat it with a shot and changing their therapy course and doing different therapy. And it's curable, so it goes away. It, but it's just really coming from a change in their posture, a change in their gait, the way they walk, the way they stand. 
um, that's really the main cause of sacroiliac joint dysfunction after spinal fusion surgery of the lumbar spine. Again, completely treatable and curable, as long as you do a shot and the right therapy. And our last question, a viewer says they have a stress fracture at L4-5 and have pain down their leg. What would you recommend as treatment? So uh, one of our viewers says I have a fracture at L4-5 and I have pain down my leg. Uh, what would I recommend as treatment? So the first thing that I always like to tell patients is I need to see you and your films first before I make any determination. Um, but let's just say that this person has painted the perfect picture. They have a cracked PARS, so it's called a PARS defect of L4, and it's allowing the L4 bone to slip forward on L5. Now, most spine surgeons would treat that with a fusion. Most spine surgeons that do fusions would treat that with a fusion. Um, some surgeons would treat it conservatively with just shots and therapy. I usually recommend the laser surgery, the Duke laser disc repair. It's a new surgery that doesn't involve any fusion or open surgery. It's all done with a small seven millimeter incision. It's done arthroscopically. It's the only arthroscopic surgery that can be done for a spondylolisthesis, basically a, the situation we're describing here, I believe, which is a um, pars defect or a crack through the pars inner articularis of L4, either one side or both sides. So with that pars defect and herniation pinching the nerve, the best treatment in the world by far is the Duke laser disc repair. That's D-E-U-K, laser disc repair, performed only here at Duke Spine Institute. The reason why it's the best is it's a tiny little cut, outpatient. For one disc, it'd be about a 45-minute surgery with a 95% success rate of getting rid of the pain in your back and leg, and it won't come back. And you do all that without screws and rods, without doing any kind of fusion. So it's much safer for the patient, and it's a much faster recovery. It's an hour recovery as opposed to spending weeks in, in the hospital or at home recovering with painful, you know, pain and narcotic medications. That's typical for a fusion. The fusion we did today, for example, the patient that I just did at L4-5, L5-S1 fusion on, this patient will require narcotic painkillers for at least two weeks, probably four weeks at home. These uh, narcotic that we use is called Dilaudid. It's hydromorphone. It's a very powerful narcotic opioid but it's necessary to treat the pain they have from the uh, surgery. And the remember, we talked about this in the surgery. People, patients' pain after spine surgery like this comes from the muscles. So the more a surgeon can do to protect the muscles, the less pain the patient will have after surgery. To prove that point, uh, we're now putting the bandage on this patient right now as we speak. Uh, Lori is putting the bandage on, and this patient's gonna wake up in the next 10 minutes and we're going to get the patient back to the recovery area. And from the recovery area, they're gonna go home. And we'll interview this patient as they're going home, as long as the patient allows me to. Now, about half the patients say, no, I don't, I don't wanna do a, a live camera interview. I want my privacy. I'm not happy with my hairstyle right now or my makeup or whatever the reason is that they don't wanna do it, and that's fine. So I'd say there's a coin toss 50-50. Our patient will allow us to do an interview that will be live and streamed over the internet as they're leaving our surgery center and going home. And once again, they're just getting their bandage put on and the, radiolo uh, the anesthesiologist will be waking them up in the next 10 minutes. And then we'll start our last surgery, which will be a, a Duke laser disc repair, uh, L5S1 on a young man who's an athlete. And this young man traveled um, from several states over uh, to come here and have the Duke laser disc repair done at L5-S1 because he has an injured disc at L5-S1 with a disc herniation, a disc bulge, and he's having a lot of back pain going into both le legs. So he's having the Duke laser disc repair rather than a fusion. Any other questions? All right, well, hopefully you enjoyed the broadcast and come back in about 45 minutes for the next surgery.